Hello and welcome back to Murder Analyze, my partners in crime, welcome back. Now, today's case, you know, is this Golden State Killers case, but a little bit of a twist to it because as you've been seeing, I've been doing these sort of um, faceless videos to introduce sort of different things into Murder Analyzed, this channel. And one of them is this genetic forensic um, analysis thing that's going on. Now, the Golden State Killer was one of the main cases that really started using this genetics, you know, to um, find killers, right? And it's absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you've seen the videos before, but they are faceless. Them ones always will be faceless. So, um, I think once when, when we're exploring this case and we're looking at the state of California in this, who this case really was shocking for this um, area and really for, for many many years many people were afraid and really it, was, it just caused so much issues uh, within the state of California this this case because no one really knew who he was right and you know people were worried they really were worried this was a really worrying time in this area and this forensic genetic genealogy um, sort of broke through that, it, 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 it really found him, and people couldn't believe it after all these years, right, they, they found him, this Golden State Killer, this Joseph James D'Angelo, um, he was caught, and all them years of all that fear, and these poor people that lost their lives to this man, um, with, and the police had no real understanding of who this person was, or how he was getting away with it, and everything else, and this one new piece of technology, right, saved this, the, it gave these victims a voice, right, it gave the families some, you know, they, they could now mourn, they could, they knew their children were dead, they didn't know who did it, there was lots and lots of people um, that had been murdered by this man, they, this genetic forensic genealogy is a game changer, right, it's a game changer for people like him who've got away with these crimes for so many years. This won't be the case anymore once, and this is just starting, right, it's really, it's been about five years now since this technique has been started being used and it is all over the place now, technology is getting better. So if you are a criminal, right, and you have done these sort of crimes and you haven't been caught yet, expect a knock at the door because no one wants someone like this man or any other killer like this person to get away with murder or serious, serious crimes that have affected societies in such a way. You will be caught, so expect the knock on the door. So I suppose our case really, this case starts in the early 1970s, doesn't it really? Got to go back all that way back it's um there was a series of brutal brutal crimes that affected this area it was a time where you know the 70s i mean i can remember the 70s that's how old i am but you can imagine in the 70s right how it was how they lived and stuff and then all of a sudden these crimes started to happen which were so brutal and so horrendous, really. And the press in them days, as they do now, like to name, you know, or give a name to these certain offenders. And the name that was given to this offender was the Golden State Killer. So this perpetrator, this Golden State Killer, as he was dubbed by the press, um, committed over 50 rapes, right? And at least what we know are 13 murders in this time. His MI, or Motus Operandi, was to break in at night, right, to the victim's properties, tie people up, sort of taunt them, torture them, before he actually 
committed any of the acts on them. These people were in fear of their life. These people didn't just die, right, or raped. They were tormented, tortured by this man, psychologically tortured by this man before he actually either decided to rape you or kill you. Right? This is the sort of killer that we are talking about when we talk about the Golden State Killer. And this is a person that evaded the law for many, many years. For some reason, right, now we know why. There were no clues left at this crime scene. And I think this is what made it so worrying. It was like a ghost. You'd get in, do what you had to do, and leave. But by leaving no clues, very, very difficult to catch someone like that. Actually, impossible, right? Impossible. Because the only reason this man was caught was through genetic forensic genealogy. Or else this man would still be living his little life, even though he was old, right? Happily. And he evaded the law. So this is why this is so important. And I know a lot of you out there are studying your different A-levels and you're going to do your degrees. This new technology, right, is a game changer, even you. So you could imagine in this society, can't you, that there was fear, right? Frustration, the police were frustrated because they just didn't have anything. The community were fearful because they understood that the police didn't have anything, right? So who's going to be next? Where's it going to strike next? The fear lasted for years. Now don't forget in the early 70s, right? And really leading up to the 80s, 86 sort of time. There was no real DNA, right? CCTV wasn't used then really like it is now. Now CCTV was really put in to prevent crime. Right? That's why it started to come in. But it's actually now used as a tool to um, solve crime. Right? But in the 70s, there wasn't any of that either. We didn't have mobile phones. No one was taking pictures. No one was filming. Right? No one could ring straight away the police. You know, if you didn't have a phone in your home, you had to go to the call box and do it. You know what I mean? The times were different then. Uh, would this killer still got away with it now? Well... Um, I think with him, maybe, to tell you the truth. Maybe not so much with the DNA, but with the other stuff. Yeah, he was a very clever, clever man, really. But as we know about him now, he had not only luck on his side, he had a lot of inside information on his side. So this case was a, a case opened for years because of all the attacks and the different things and the, you know, the, the, the crimes, uh, offences that he'd committed. But for many, many years, it was quiet. And um, that's when it went cold. Because you had detectives at that time only relying on old forms of investigation. Eyewitness testimonies, you know, anything left at the scene, photographs and stuff, which wasn't enough to catch this man. And this man knew that, right? But as technology, then starts to evolve, right? Um, that's when things started to change. For all them years, don't forget, all them years, the people that were assaulted, the people that were murdered, their families had nothing, right? They were just a number, really, just another number of the victims to this man. There was no way that anyone was being held accountable for this. And you can't blame the police, right? You can't, because now we know about this case. You can't blame the police. They, they did everything they could do with the technology at the time that they had, and it wasn't a lot. Okay, so let's fast forward, right? Let's go right now to the 2000s. Let's jump all that, because we know the frustration, everything these people had. Many people, family members had passed away without ever finding out what really happened to their loved ones. People who were victims of his assaults are also deceased um, by this stage or had, you know, um, other issues which had left them 
uh, that he had left them with after these assaults. It was um, a shocking time for these people. So let's now move to these 2000s and the advancements in DNA technology that had opened up these doors to this forensic science, right? Now, we all know about it now, but in early 2000s, this was the new big thing. People didn't like it. It's like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, you know, it, but it works, right? And it's been proven that it works. And now as them advances are coming on, it's proven and proven and proven that this is the only way now to solve crime. Prevent? Mm, not so sure. But to solve? Yes. If the perpetrator leaves evidence or leaves a body, right? Let's be honest. That's really where we're at now. So the other part of this is where we're looking at the genealogical part, the databases, where people have been looking for their ancestors and stuff. So all this sort of thing started to come in before DNA wasn't used. So it first started off at looking at records and different things. And you know, Lacey, um, my granddaughter it, has done that for years, right? She's autistic, she loves it, right? She loves it. And it's for these sort of people that have used these sort of sites for years and have can manage these sort of large amounts of data and, and where they fit and stuff. And then you add in now where people are putting their DNA in to find people and stuff. This is now what's happening in our world today. So in 2018, we're now in 2024. So in 2018, they had run out of options, right, to find this Golden State Killer. They could not find him. Don't forget, anything they had would have been put into databases anyway, right? But nothing was coming up. Because unless you have a criminal record, unless you have your DNA put into a criminal database, um, you won't be there. Right? And as I keep saying, a lot of criminals, especially people like this, we have serial killers and stuff like this, these are very educated, highly intelligent people, most of them, right? Um, that don't get caught. They don't. They try to evade the law in such a way they understand it, and especially this man really understood it, didn't he? So they've evaded the law, so of course nothing was there. All of a sudden now though, in 2018, we have the genetics, right? The forensic genetic part of it. We're going to now, so now they don't have to just look at you. We can look right back. Any part of your DNA sequence as they break it down and reform it to find out who's your closest relative. Now listen, I'm not just talking about putting it into a, you know, a database and an AI is going to, well, here we go, it's done. No, it takes hours, weeks, months of work. Right? This took months and months of work to track back through the DNA part of it to, because don't forget, in his day, 1970s, he wasn't worried about leaving DNA in his semen, was he? That wasn't what he was worried about, or DNA fingerprint or anything, you know, clothes on, you know, DNA on the body from him, transferred to him. They weren't thinking that in them days, these killers, but they are now, but they weren't then. So as we now gone through and they've uploaded this killer's DNA because they had it, because he left it, because as I said, he didn't know anything about it. They collected it from the crime scene and this public um, genealogy database mm -hmm. called um, GEDmatch. This moved, um, I suppose was a gamble because with any part of DNA, once you start using it, right, analysing it, breaking it down, um, that's it, it's gone. And, you know, we're talking about quite old crimes here, so it could have been degraded. There may not have been a lot of it left. There may not have been a, a lot of it taken from the crime scenes and the swabs, as long as them swabs were kept and um, stored well, this all comes back again to this great police investigation and how they really did preserve that evidence from that crime scene. That gives the people today a chance to get these killers. So, but with DNA there, the minute you start to mess around with DNA, you can't then reuse it. 
and sometimes um, these people that use the DNA know that it could be their last chance to get that killer. And um, so it's really important that we understand what it takes. You know, we need answers to these crimes, um, but the time and effort that go into it from the new, I don't know, the new areas of police investigation now, the new techniques that we're using, but they're only possible because of the old techniques of what the police officers used, the investigators used the people that went to the crime scene, the people that went and collected that evidence then, many years ago, is only what holds the weight for now, right? For now. So now this DNA has now been put into this database and now they're looking now at the family history of this DNA profile, because that's all it is at the minute, it's a profile, there's no name to it, right? There is no name, because there's nothing out there on this person that will give them a direct name. So it takes weeks and weeks, months of work to come down and come down and come down and come down until you have a suspect or maybe a few suspects, right? And you then have to do your own physical work, again, investigation, the old school investigation where now you're looking at was that person that was that person there at that time? Did he do this? Did he do that? You know, so you can break down to that person. But then that's not it. You can't use then that DNA in a court of law to say that person is the person. You can use it in conjunction with everything else from the DNA that was found at the crime scene all them years ago to then the DNA that's taken from the genealogy how it's worked down. But then you need a DNA sample now, right, from the person now, the person that you think is the suspect that has committed these crimes, you need that DNA now, right? If you have that now, then you have a case, but you have to have it, right? So I think what these investigators would have done would have gone to visit this man um, first, right? Probably, I think, first of all, they would have got his DNA. Now, whether they get that willingly, um, which they probably didn't with this man, I'm not really sure. Um, but most of them do go through your rubbish and stuff like that, cigarette, cigarette butts, everything else, to get the DNA, right? Your DNA that is relevant to you now. And then they match that up with everything else they've got. If it's a hit, they know it's you. There is no getting out of it. They know it's you. Then they're going to just come and have a little chat with you, you know, about this case, you know, just going over some old notes, right? Because they want you to deny, deny, deny. And then once you deny, right, then they have a case. Really. Because you could have been in these people's houses for a reason. Couldn't you? Your fingerprint, your DNA could have been on that body for a reason. But if you deny not knowing them and you deny having no knowledge of that, you've never met them, never been in their house, why is your DNA there? Why is your DNA in the body of a woman, right, that you've murdered? That's when they get you. And I think it's for that reason that these cases take to so long to really be um, looked at because they have to be so correct with it, right? It has to be spot on or else some court's going to throw it out, right? So you've got to be spot on because you are saying that from this genealogy, forensic genealogy, that you've found a match to a DNA that's maybe 30, 40, 50 years old, right? Now, though, you've matched that 40, 50 years DNA with this person now. Now, I'll tell you the truth, a lot of these perpetrators that do these sort of crimes have passed away. And it's not unheard of that the police will dig up your body, right? They will. They want that DNA. They're going to take it from a rib or a tooth, whatever. And they, but they need to know because these families and these victims that are still living need closure. And these people should be held accountable for their actions. So on the 24th of April 2018, right, decades of searching for this man came to an end. They got him on that. It came to an end. This Golden State Killer was named. 
He was named as Joseph um, James D'Angelo, a former police officer living in uh, Citrus Hills in California. He was arrested. Former police officer. So that's how he evaded the law. And we talked about many psychopaths before who have wanted to join the police force, right? Many of them didn't make it into the police force, thank goodness. They didn't, but they have tried to get in because it gives them that power, you see. This man, though, was a police officer, and he was a police officer for many years. I think what the case shows us, right, yes, we had this man caught. He was caught fair and square, right? It took weeks, years, I think, of work to catch this man. As I said, the credit must go to the early detectives, really, who went through that crime scene. They done their investigations. They took the evidence they had at the time. They stored it well. They preserved it. They didn't contaminate it in any way. That gave the people today, or in 2018, the investigators then, an open door to say, okay, it's our last chance. Let's use this technique. And what a difference that has made. And as I've said in my faceless videos when I talk about genetic forensic um, techniques, is that it's a, a game changer, isn't it? And I think a lot of criminals, a lot of murderers, a lot of serial killers that are still out there were worried when the Golden State Killer was caught. Because if they can catch him, they can catch anyone. And I think this is what makes this case so fascinating, is that it took all these years, from the 1970s when this man was going around attacking women, killing women, to 2018 when technology caught up with him. And for all the people that worked on this case, and there was many that worked on this case, the, the genealogists and all these people that worked on this case was amazing and the work and the achievement of getting this man um, after all them years and giving that family and the victims that survived him some peace of mind. Then in 2020, Joseph James D'Angelo pleaded guilty to multiple counts of murder and rape as part of a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. Well, he was old anyway by then. He was sentenced to life in prison without put the possibility of parole. In the courtroom, survivors and victims, families finally had a chance to confront this awful, awful man that had caused them such pain and fear for all these years. So if we, when we do talk about all this DNA stuff, right, um, you know, you have people that say, I don't want my DNA used for that, I don't want my DNA used for this. I think when you look at the overwhelming evidence and you have to think if your family member was a victim of crime like this, right, or you were a victim of crime, a serious crime like this, this man was terrible, right, and some of these women survived, um, you would want justice. You need to know that the person that done that to you is not doing it to anybody else. So yes, do I think that criminals are going to get away with it still? Yes, probably, right? This costs money. It doesn't cost as much, but it costs money and it costs time. I think the impact, isn't it, of this, of this case extends beyond, really, D'Angelo and being caught for this, convi you know, this conviction, these terrible crimes. It, it goes way beyond that. It sparked a discussion about ethical use, and I spoke about that before when I do... Um, talk about this ethical use right is important because DNA is us right that's what it is it's us we um, go into these databases a lot of different databases now have been created these genealogical databases so you can track your ancestors and stuff but most of them now will put up that your DNA could be used in solving crime, right? And you can opt in or opt out from that. So there are 
difficult issues with it. Um, but I think, do they outweigh, and this is a question for you, right? Do they outweigh what you can gain from it? We can take serial killers off the street. We can help, hopefully, prevent some people from doing it. Not all, and I'll go into that in a minute. We can give victims and secondary victims closure, right, to it. We can save other people from having this sort of crime done to them. So yes, when we talk about ethics, there is, and I've said this a lot about ethics, but what outweighs what? Do you think it's worth it, right? Would you give your DNA, because now you can go on databases that have been set up, to give your DNA to be specifically used to find a criminal like this, right? Which will help cold cases be solved. Now, we're not just talking about cold cases, are we? We're also talking about Jane Doe's, John Doe's, people that have been found for many, many years and have been buried in unmarked graves because nobody knows who they are, right? And from the use of this sort of DNA, these people have been named, which also gives their family closure, right? But also then the police can reinvestigate what happened to these people because once they have a name of the person, they can then go and look at what that person was doing around that time of the murder. Who is they with? That sort of thing. So it opens up doors for reinvestigations. I think my thing is, is that when we talk about criminal investigation, right? We, it comes down to money. DNA is about money. Right? So you can actually even donate now to some of these databases money specifically to help solve a crime. And if everyone gives a pound or two pounds or two dollars or ten dollars, that adds up. And then that, I think the, uh, I think one of the labs charges just for that, just to break down the DNA, about five thousand uh, dollars. It, it changes. So the cost is coming down. DNA used to be so, so expensive when it first came out to have it analysed and stuff. It's not like that anymore. So I'd like your thoughts on that. What do you think about, one, this Golden State killer, you know, who's now been in prison for the rest of his life, alluded to death penalty, but he was old anyway. And I think, to tell you the truth, the death penalty is too good for this man. I think he was quite clearly meant to be locked up, and that's where he should be. An ex-copper, a killer... A serial killer in prison it's not going to be good for him so I think that's the best thing that could have happened to him but when we talk about DNA privacy the ethics of it what do you think what are your thoughts on this is it enough to forsake some of that to catch a killer or the best option I believe and I think that's what's happening in the minute is that you can opt in or opt out from using your DNA I think there's a lot going on here and as we become more and more used to this sort of crime solving tool, it will become really part of our everyday life. I think the victim's impact statement in this case, it said for years we lived in fear. But today we stand here knowing that justice has been served. D'Angelo will never hurt anyone else again. Listen, this has been the Golden State Killer case. Quick case, but an interesting case at that. Let me know your thoughts. But thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And don't forget, as I always forget to say, hit the subscribe button, <coughs> notification bell, anything else you need to do, and share this with your other true crime enthusiasts. So, till the next time. Bye for now.